<clears throat> Over to you, Steve. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in a way, this is coming home for me. I was here when this building was built and spent a lot of time here with a number of you uh, th uh, for, for a long time. And uh, coming to Ottawa is not new for me. I came here in 1975. The first book I did on U.S.-Canada relations came out in 77, I think, so I've been around here for a very long time. But th this, this is fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. It's um, a new area for me, and I've tried to put together some things that I've worked on in different places. You'll see. But let me begin. We live today in a moment of, of significant historical transition, what I call the end of the 70 good years, the years after World War II, and the emergence of a new global order, or perhaps disorder, we'll see as we go along. Uh, many of our core assumptions about how the world works are coming undone. For government leaders and business leaders and academics and everyone else, there'll be rough times ahead, I say, as we have to relearn, recalibrate how things work. And again, I will go into more detail by what I mean with that. First, a word about 70 years. Uh, good years. I'm well aware that historians divide these 70 years into at least two parts. The Tronc Glorios, the 70, the glorious 30 years right after the war, characterized by rapid economic growth, by declining inequality, by the creation of wide social welfare policies, and so on. What, this is what Andrew Schoenfield called the managed economy and the welfare state. The second, from the mid-1970s, was characterized by dramatic changes in policies that focused on smaller governments, on markets, on privatization. We called that neoliberalism, what Ken Galbraith called the conservative reaction. I don't really want to get into discussions about the periodization. Uh, I have written on this myself years ago on British, Britain's post-war economic policies. My point is this, is that this entire period, uh, uh, throughout the period, policies were developed and implemented within the same basic framework of how things worked. In a word, world characterized largely, and again, let me say a word, what I mean by largely. It's a bit of a slippery word for me, because I don't want to try to paint everything with the same brush. There'll be examples that, that, that are contrary to what I'm saying. But in a world largely characterized by linear change, a world in which change was gradual, the word orderly comes to mind, one step preceding, uh, succeeding another. Another way to say this, my professional life and business was developing uh, 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 scenarios for companies usually, and I would have said here that in this period, uh, the, li the, the range of likely future scenarios in most dimensions of our lives for the 70 years were, were quite similar. They were clustered. The, the most likely scenario, the next most likely scenario were, were very similar. Uh, I see that we are moving rapidly into quite a different situation in which change in many critical areas will be discontinuous, veering toward chaotic, and by that I mean hard to predict, hard to forecast what is happening. The most likely scenarios are, are now widespread. The most likely scenario and the next most may be quite different, 180 degrees difference, it's quite possible. Um, <coughs> What is driving this profound alteration in the basic structure in which we live, in which we plan and implement? I see three powerful forces. I see technology, climate change, and, and, and demography. Perhaps you will come up with uh, and others equally powerful that are shaping the world in which we are entering, but let's start here. And what I plan to do in the next while, not too long, is to share with you a number of case studies drawn from research I've been involved in over the past couple of years. And I think I can make myself clearer in the general view by looking at some case studies. So start with automobiles. Some of you know me well. I love automobiles because I haven't owned one since 1974. I mean, and uh, uh, in addition, I have to say, in 1956, my mother and I bought a Bel Air red and white Chevy convertible. If there was ever a beautiful thing in this world, <laughs> that, that Bel Air convertible was a beautiful thing. The only mistake that was made, there should have been a little plate in front saying, do not sell this car. It is a, it is a, it is a keeper. <laughs> and that's when gas was 25 cents a gallon, if you want to talk about that. You could go into a gas station for a buck at four gallons, and it was not uncool. 
50 cents was uncool, but a dollar was okay. Um, all right, cars are still basically the same as they were in the 1950s. Significant changes are underway, and that's really what I want to talk about. But up till now, what do we got? We got an internal combustion engine driven by gasoline, a metal box on wheels with rubber tires, a driver, one driver, a driver who is usually the owner of the vehicle, and owning a car was for most of us a defining characteristic of our lives. It was autonomous. As I played with this, I was fascinated, because this is the way we used the word then. Autonomy meant that we were not connected. You got in the car and you were independent. We were autonomous. There's a wonderful line from an advertisement. Uh, with, the, with the open road before you, you can go anywhere. From behind the wheel, you take control of your destiny. Cars are empowering. Ownership means that you have the means to be independently mobile, that you own not just a vehicle, but choice as well. That's what we meant by autonomy then. Over the years, cars acquired more technology. The most advanced technology in my last car was an AM radio. Uh, shows you when. Changes were made in how cars were constructed. Obviously, the Japanese system was a major influence on, on US car manufacturing. But the fundamentals didn't change. Still a car. Planning in the automobile industry was really straightforward. The major automakers' vehicles were basically the same. They competed for a small share of the market, a percentage of a percentage of the market. Uh, design, advertising, and occasional price bait counted heavily. Change proceeded linearly in the sense that you went from manual to automatic gear shifting. Air conditioning came, power steering. These were all anticipated adjustments to the basic box. And indeed, as, as many of you will know, many of these so-called improvements were invented long before they were offered to the public. Again, we don't see dramatic, profound changes in the thing. Now, there were significant changes. I mean, not in the box. But for example, the transition from the Ford production model that brought all the parts into a large-scale assembly, think of River Rouge, uh, to highly extended supply chains that were made possible by improvements in communication and transportation, which led to reduced costs. Now, this is a significant change in how the vehicles were made, put together, but didn't change the car. Made a little less expensive. Japanese techniques may have made it better. These were really changes at the margin of the product and didn't affect the fundamental nature of, of the vehicle. Now, in the next few years, all of this is going to change. None of this will remain the same. But what is interesting, and that's, this is my point, we do not know how it's going to change. What kind of autos? Powered by what? Probably electricity, but it could be hydrogen, or a cleaner petroleum product, or a biofuel. If we talk about electricity, we have to talk about how it's generated. Is it coal? Is it nuclear? And this moves into a whole area of infrastructure requirements, renewing the grid. And again, as you all know, most of you know, great levels of uncertainty here. At building charging stations, and again, high levels of uncertainty how this is going to be done. Dealing with old batteries. And one I really liked, we talked a lot about classes I did here, lectures I did here, cleaning up old gasoline stations. Expensive, interesting things. I had a student at Western Washington University, all my, my MBA students were all part-time. His company had bought a old, uh, uh, I don't remember, gas station, but lovely, all that big flat space. And they found that the uh, tanks, the underwater, underground tanks, were filled with leaded gasoline. Can you think of the years of, of litigation to, to determine who, who did that? And if you don't know this, at Columbia University, in SICE, you can get a degree in lust, in lust, linking underground storage tanks. But I would always want to have a friend who got a degree in lust. Well, what I want to sort of fork, you know, underline here is the connectivity. The rise of the auto industry in the 20s drove the total restructuring of the steel, rubber, petroleum industries, of transportation infrastructure, roads, new businesses like motels and gas stations. Sometimes looking forward, as we do today, area, we forget about the interconnections 
And uh, again, one wants to underline that. The shin bone is connected to the knee bone. And as we move forward, we'll, I'll talk about that. Okay, what kind of car, but what kind of drivers? Who's going to drive? Maybe not. Autonomous now is a different word in automobile. Autonomous means cars without drivers. And yet the cars will be very interconnected to each other. So the autonomy, the, the notion of autonomy has changed. What was essential to us in, the, in my era of driving was the independence of driving your own car. And that 56 Chevy Bel Air was something. Uh, today, it is not driving at all, but having some agency. And, you know, uh, who's going who's to own these things? How do they work? Tesla, Waymo, Uber? Uber, you know, is putting million dollars at the moment into flying cars. Uh, another big question. Smart cars or smart infrastructure? Again, this is sort of beside the point today, but I don't think smart cars are the answer. I, I rather doubt that they'll be driverless cars. Too complicated, too expensive, too uncertain. My sense is that you're better off with dumb cars and smart infrastructure. Uh, uh, I'll, Bob Lutz wrote a, a piece. Lutz was the, the Ford guy, the fast motor car guy we all liked. He wrote, now we are approaching the end of the line for the automobile because travel will be in standardized modules. The end state will be the fully autonomous module with no capability for the driver to exercise command. You will call for it. It will arrive at your location. You'll get in, input your destination, go to the freeway. On the freeway, it will merge seamlessly into a stream of other modules. The speed doesn't matter. You have a blending of rail type with individual transportation. I mean, the issue there is... Is, is the car going to be the smart thing, weaving in and out, or is it going to be a car like a bus or like a subway? Or, 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 or. Well, and, then, and then that raises another good question. Will individual autos remain the dominant means of tr personal transportation? Uh, here, demographics may be a powerful driver of change. In a society which is urbanizing or really a, metropolitanizing, transit may become the more important term is issue rather than, than transportation. About 80% of North America's population now live in urban areas. Now, again, there's definitional problems, as some of you will know, because in urban now we include a lot of suburban territories where, where it's still car territory. But there's a clear movement in Canada and the United States from rural to metro, if not urban. Some experts talk about the rise of a new mobility culture, replacing our traditional auto culture could be. But data is interesting. The, the percentage of American 16-year-olds with driver's licenses declined from 46% in 1983 to 25% in 2014. Now, a lot of young people don't drive because they can't afford a car. They're still living at home. But that's a, more, that's a very interesting data point, I think. What about changes in transit? Buses, ride shares, under and overground rail are all out there. What else? flying cars and moving sidewalks. <coughs> Will one of these win out, become the dominant form? Will they all become part of a single integrated transit system? I think, again, this is very much a personal opinion, that the lit literature is so dominated by the concept of autonomous autos that no one writes about buses. I think buses is the, is the, is the lost par part of this. And connectivity? Look more broadly at transit issues. Ownership, municipal or private. How do you pay for this stuff? Taxes, fees, what about maintenance? And once you begin here, you're soon involved in all sorts of questions of urban, of city finance, uh, lacking garages, lacking parking meters. Uh, all, all that revenue collapses. <coughs> Will ride sharing produces more left congestion? So you've, you've heard all this. The only thing for sure that I can tell you, tell you is that no one will experience the joy of that 1956 soft top, let me tell you. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> um, look, I'm not trying to forecast anything here. What I'm saying is that future policies, future plans, and implementation will be determined with a much wider array of possibilities or options than existed in our, area, our era. Many more options are going to be on the table. And I think it will be much more difficult to determine 
what is going to be the likely direction of change, not to mention the end of change, to forecast with any confidence what's coming next. Now, think of this. Compare the task of planning in the auto industry in the second half of the 20th, 20th century with trying to plan in the, in the emerging transportation industry in the world of 2020, 2050. Planners in the earlier period could easily assume that the environment in which they were planning auto development would remain basically the same. That the vehicle that had been there for decades would continue to be the chosen best vehicle for getting around. There would not be extraordinary changes. Uh, technology, climate, demographics, nothing was going to upset the basic model. So you, the, the Ford, the Chevy people didn't look out that far, but they could look out with confidence five, ten years out. And their, the guys who they paid to look further out were just not designing a different version of the same box. It wasn't going to change very much. Uh, today, where would you put your money? Now, I don't want to claim that things are going to be different. That's more than I plan to do with this. I think they will. But it's that we don't know what they're going to be. That's really the key. In past years, the most likely scenarios clustered together. In the future, possible scenarios will span a much broader area. Try to think what an urban transit system will look like in, say, 25 or 50 years. What, you, if you're at all up on this, you'll have at least 10 different views of what it might be. Try to say which is the most likely, hard to say, because there are so many other variables that, that play there. All you can say is that there are a lot of possibilities. And 25 to 50 years is probably less time it would take to pay for whatever you chose anyway. And if you chose wrong, you have a big problem. Now, I don't mean to suggest, again, that rough times must necessarily mean bad times. The changes I am discussing may stir great creativity and lead to better outcomes. Uncertainty creates opportunity as well as risk. Our kids or our grandkids may look back from what seems to them to be a highly rational world to what seems to them to be a world of waste and inefficiency. I won't say that is off the table, but it'll be rough because of the many options that exist simultaneously. And when you pay this through, play this through, the cost of development and a failure making the wrong choice will be enormous. Years ago, I had the opportunity to advise a Malaysian government agency. Malaysia, when I was there working, um, what got rich making semiconductors. Semiconductors is a high tech, tech, tech product made by low tech, tech labor. They had put a lot of money aside and they wanted to do something next. But they couldn't decide what to do because they figured they only had one choice. Which way would they go? What would be the next project? Uh, it, you know, it, it's, we are going to be perhaps in that situation or maybe people just rush ahead in all directions. Again, I don't want to play that game quite yet. Another case, jobs. Technological change that was basically linear and job creating. Again, think of this. The technology, technological change throughout the post-war period I'm talking about. By and large, created jobs in the sense that if a job was eliminated, the person's skills enabled them to move to another similar job. We did not find whole sectors eliminated. Uh, again, it happened. I didn't I want to say not, never. But by and large, and I'll come back to this, people could move uh, from one to the other. Uh, in Galbraith's New Industrial State, when again, one of the books I'm most interested in, 1966, he writes that the large U.S. companies have solved the key problems that roiled companies since the 1880s, dealing with workers, dealing with shareholders, dealing with government, and dealing with each other. How did they do this? Basically, by longer-term planning, keeping longer-term goals in mind. They figured it out. Schoenfeld tells us that our post-war systems, this is in six, also 66, have conquered the violence of the marketplace. We figured it out. And the answer is always understanding the context, understanding the movement, which is basically linear and understandable, orderly. 
Speaking of longer term, think of this. This is a PIP. Think of an education at our high school and college levels. Think today. Education, high school and college level. That prepared most people at high school level for working class, college perhaps for management, that prepared most people for work that would continue for their entire productive lives. Wow. Imagine an education system would be that you could be sure once the kid graduated from high school or college, that knowledge, that, those skills would last that person for their entire productive career. Wow. But that's the way it was. Um, technological change, skill requirements, and secondary and college level education were all well integrated. Let me tell you about my high school. I went to a high school where people didn't go to college. It's funny, you talk to people elsewhere, they think Americans always went to college. When I was a kid, graduated from high school, 4% of white American men went to college. College was not the standard thing. And I went to a high school that didn't produce a to to college. I was the second student, second graduate in 40 years to go to a four-year college outside the immediate area where the high school was. Uh, this was not a highly uh, educational place. I always said there were two, two majors in my high school, violence and study hall. <laughs> in a very real sense, for the vast majority of the young people there, high school was designed to keep people safe and off the streets until they could go to work. When I graduated, uh, I, was, I was that nice Jewish doctor's son, so I knew everybody, and I was going to college, and my colleague said to me, you're not so smart. I said, I am smart. No, you're not. What are you going to do? Are you going to go to college? Are you going to be a doctor? No. Are you going to be a lawyer? No. Are you going to be a businessman? No. I said, I'll probably be a teacher. They said, see, not very smart. <laughs> and, and they said, we're going to go to the mills or wherever. We'll work eight hours a day, five days a week for 25 years. We'll have our health insurance. We'll have our retirement. We'll own our own ho homes. Our wives will never work. We'll send our kids to college. And every two years, we'll buy a new car which is what we did in those days. And they said, will you live as well as well, I did? And I said, I don't think so. So they said, see, you're not so smart. I told this story for years. And then I began thinking about it. There's a better story there. This is a bunch of 18-year-olds whose skill levels were modest, whose educational background was thin, and yet they stood there with utter certainty to predict where they would be in 25 years. My MBA students I have taught at Pace for years, if I asked them where they were going to be in six months, half of them would say, I don't have the slightest idea. Is there one of the major differences between our eras is the level of security that my high school colleagues felt and the level of fear that young people fear today, feel today. I mean, the, I never knew anyone. I never knew anyone who, at high school or college, who ever thought they'd be out of work, that they couldn't find a job. That, 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 that I never, that was never in our, in our book. I think, that, I mean, and, and part of that is the education system, without thinking about it, provided them with what was enough, not much, but enough, to last their entire career. Well, I defy any of us you know, educate people, come up with, a, uh, with a, an educational system today that would do anything like that. The fact is we were able, without thinking about it, to plan a long-term plan for the welfare of our, our, of our kids. That educational system, again, whatever level, worked. Uh, uh. Now, again, I don't, that doesn't mean that there wasn't change. Not at all. There were new devices, new machinery, new techniques. Uh, whether in an office, I remember my mother who helped me when I worked for the Ford Foundation would come in and she wept when we had bought an IBM Caracible. Remember the Caracible with a white tape that you could erase? I mean, she, did, she wept real tears. She'd never seen anything so glorious. My company was the first small company to buy IBM display writers. But it really didn't change much that what we were doing. The, it made it easier in some ways. Uh, uh, but rarely was the change so radical that existing workforce could not adapt or that existing operations were driven out of business. This is what I, I, I mean by linear change, by long the ability to think long term. We didn't think we were thinking long term, because it never amended our minds that we weren't thinking long term. 
When those kids, my chums graduate from high school, too young for Korea, they would be too old for Vietnam, it never occurred to them that what they had learned there wouldn't be enough to carry them all the way through. I, I I'm, you know, cannot but be impressed. So, will jobs be gone? Current views cover all the bases. Uh, here's a quote. I want to tell you straight off what this story is about. Sometime in the next 40 years, robots uh, are going to take your job. I don't care if what your job is. If you dig ditches, a robot will dig them better. If you're a magazine writer, a robot will write them better. If you're a doctor, IBM's Watson will no longer assist you in finding the right diagnosis from its database. It will just be a better doctor than you. You've probably read or heard of Kai-Fu Lee. This really uh, echoes Kai-Fu Lee's view. Here's a McKinsey view. The automotive industry is at the same time transitioning into a mobility industry. And while jobs in manufacturing will decrease, the mobility industry will become a job engine for adjacent industries. Uh, whatever. Good. Here's another one from McKinsey. Lighthouses. Speaking of lighthouses, leading edge companies, lighthouses are injectors of human capital. Rather than placing, replacing operators with machines, lighthouses are transforming work to make it less repetitive, more interesting, diversified, and productive. Augment instead of replace the operator. Invest in capacity, building, and long-term learning. That's the spake McKinsey. Come on. Really? I mean, this is where the what gets way ahead of the how. Uh, transform work to make it less repetitive, more interesting, and diversified, and productive. Shit, what you do is you fire people, and you replace them with robots. Come on. Who doesn't do that? This is just nonsense. I mean, this again, maybe it's going to happen, but this strikes me as um, a lot of wind. What do we know? To be utterly frank, we have no idea how this is going to play out over the next 20 years, 50 years. We do have some pieces of the puzzle. We know that the fastest growing job sectors are now, and I mean growing by number, not by percentage, are low skill, minimum wage, low security jobs, healthcare <coughs> workers. Retail sales, low-level logistics like in Amazon. We suspect that contract work is expanding significantly, raising issues of security, medical care, and retirement. We know, or at least we have a strong sense, that the gap between better new jobs, that is, jobs that provide reasonable income and opportunity, as opposed to low-level service jobs, that gap between those jobs and available skills is likely to increase. As a recent Deloitte report notes, a widening gap between the jobs that need to be filled and the skilled talent pool capable of filling them. This links to another issue that almost surely will become more important, urgent in the coming decades, increasing inequality. Again, I don't want to get too far in that direction, but it was irresistible. Should we include in our bag of future possible scenarios something out of Disraeli? Remember two nations? The rich and the poor, two nations between whom there is no intercourse and no sympathy, who are as ignorant of each other's habits, thoughts, and feelings as if they were dwellers in different zones or inhabitants of different planets. Uh, interesting stuff. To return to the, again, to the big question, how much of all this is going to cost? And who pays for it? And how would it be paid for? Uh, will we perhaps take the notion of public goods out of the dusty closet where it has been stuck for or interred for decades? Or will we bend wholly in the direction of privatization or maybe the mysterious P3s, public-private partnerships? I mean, if you think you can do better than guess at the moment, it's impressive to me because all of these are on the table and, and lots of different, different versions. Um, the entire business process the what, where, and how from upstream or down to downstream at every node can now confronts a Walmart of possibilities. Um, how, again, think of investing in almost any of the areas of modern we're interested in. How long was your payback? How do you, how do you really want to do this? If you're a government investing in infrastructure, what infrastructure? What are you going to plan for? I mean, I'll come back to this in a moment, but this is really key. All right. 
Getting too philosophical here. Let's move on. Let's rotate the optic a bit. Nations. This isn't, we talk about international stuff. The world order we have known for some 70 years, basically coherent, populated by well-defined players, and with fairly widely accepted rules of the game. That's what it is. The core uh, organizing principle of global affairs since World War II has been the primacy of the nation state. Uh, uh, we tend to forget that the, that the key goal of the United States after the war, as the war was ending just after the war, was the demolition of the great world empires, the Dutch, the French, the British. And the expansion of UN membership in the 60s and 70s was due, due largely to these newly independent uh, former colonies. This is truly an era of international politics. National sovereignty was the basic rule of organizations that sought to manage relations among nations. Like 1984, some, some, uh, was 84, some, uh, some uh, nations had more sovereignty than others, more power, but when you talk, think about it, it was all based on, on, on this. The primacy of the nations, of nation states is now being contested. On one hand, by powerful globalizing trends like climate change, like a global epidemics, borderless media, demographic change. And, and on the other side, it's being contested by powerful fragmenting forces of ethnic, cultural, and religious, what people call tribalism. We seems for now we're at a moment of rising nationalism, but if you think about it, that's probably not true. Rising nationalism of today is increasingly segmented into different ethnic, religious, and cultural groups. America first to many Americans is not Amer is, is white America first or some other part of America first. The same is true you know, across Europe. Current nationalism may be very destructive to traditional nations. And again, at the same time, global forces like climate change and so on force national leaders to th or, or whatever leaders to think in wider terms. It's interesting. I spent many years teaching international business in business schools. And I am well aware, unless things have changed dramatically in the past few years, many of the textbooks we have used in IB courses are revisions of, course, of text initially drafted in the 1970s. The paradigm for teaching international business for many years was the multinational corporation, the MNC. Uh, there were changes in the textbooks, but at the margins. The basic paradigm remained the same, international business. And the comp companies which dealt with this in a, in a variety of ways. Imagine thinking of a text that would work for the next 10 years or 20 years. Where would you begin? What would be the core organizing theme? How this plays out will be very much influenced by climate change and demographics. For example, we have assumed for the past 70 years that the map is completely covered by, by, by states. No question. But the impact of political disarray, economic collapse, climate change may lead to new spaces on the map that are no longer states places that are no longer governed. In terms of population, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of the world's largest nations in terms of population. But is it governed at all? Let's track this perspective, it, it track this into another perspective of population movements. Again, another case. Population movements after World War II, the, what I grew up with, the movement of DPs, displaced persons out of the camps uh, into, into Europe, into the United States, into Israel. The tremendous movement of ethnic Germans westward out of Eastern Europe, maybe one of the largest movements of population, at least in European history. Palestinian refugees, the very large cross-border movement of Muslims and Hindus after India, Pakistan, Vietnamese refugees. By and large, by and large, again, Palestinians are the exception here. These movements were complete or successful, again, I use that word gently, in that most of the migrants became settled. Looking forward, the world may be facing larger and even more difficult population movements. Demographic patterns, political and economic uncertainty, and climate change are creating a situation in which many more people may well be on the move, often to places where they are not wanted, and sometimes even violently rejected. Quick background, world population is increasing, we know that. We know that world population, the growth won't be uniform around the world. 
Uh, some regions will experience very slow or negative growth. Eastern Europe and Russia, for example, the European countries will pretty much remain the same. China's population will slow. India will increase. In other parts of the world, population will increase, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Of the 2.4 billion, and this is UN 2015, the, the latest thing we have from the UN. Of the 2.4 billion people that the UN projects will be added to global population between 2015 and 2050, 1.3 billion will be in sub-Saharan Africa. The share of global population, that area, will increase, rise to 25% from 16% today, you know, 2050. Asia's will fall, Europe's will be 11 to 7%, and North and South America will decline from 14 to 13%. Interesting. Three African nations would be among the 10 largest in 2050, Nigeria, Ethiopia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Germany, France, and Britain will be far down the score, scorecard at 25th, 28th, and 30th in terms of population. By the end of the century, given these projections, Sub-Saharan Africa will be home to about 40% of the world's population, almost as much as, as Asia, and four times the combined share of North America and Europe together. In 2100, nine of the 20 largest countries will be African. Nigeria, DR, Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Niger, Uganda, Kenya, Angola, and Mozambique. The age of global populations is also very asymmetric. A quarter of Europe's population is already 60 or older. That's a quarter now, reaching 35% in 2100. Japan's population is likely to have shrunk from 100 million to 50 million and 40% will be 65 or older. China, close to 30% will be 65. But some countries will be much younger. Half of Niger's population is now under 14. And Niger, remember, will want to be a large, large country down the road. About two-thirds of the population of other countries, Uganda, Chad, Niger, I'm sorry, uh, Angola, Somalia, Zambia, others, today is 25 or under. Looking ahead, it's not possible that some African countries, not impossible, will experience a solid economic takeover, takeoff, takeoff. Remember, in the 1960s, uh, Ghana was wealthier than South Korea. Look what happened in the, the growth of the, the, the dragons and so on. It seems less likely, however. It seems to, again, uh, options on the table. I don't like to forecast, but it does seem to me more likely at this point that the weight of, of rapid population growth will further stress uh, weak, fragile government, economic, and social structures in these countries. And note, too, that several of the largest and most fragile of these nations, Democratic Republic of the Congo, for one, will be targeted by climate change, by heat and desertification. Nigeria is another good example. The result may well be large-scale migration has to be an option on the table. Experience tells us that most migrants stay close to, to home or cross a border near to a nearby nation. But it's hard to imagine that many people will not try to enter Europe, perhaps in very large numbers. When you think about it, the possibility that these countries, Nigeria, for example, will develop a, a more solid educational system, you have to think. What we know is that nothing is even worse than educated people who can't find jobs. Think of Tunisia, think of Libya. Now, there's an obvious fit here. Aging European nations need younger people to maintain economic growth. The other way around, a European-led Marshall Plan for these countries could possibly create vast new markets for Europe. It's not, it's not difficult to be pretty pessimistic now with the rise of anti-immigrant policies and so on. But on the other hand, again, in, in the fullness of time, it's not impossible. Think about this. These will be the, among the largest countries in the world by population, many sitting on much desired, needed economic, uh, natural resources. It's not impossible that they will push global institutions away from the Euro-Atlantic-centric policies of the post-war years, of the 70 years, into something different. How would one project? changes in global institutions over the next decades. Just a few words about climate change. 
and I'm coming around the corner here. Uh, it's interesting. Given what I've discussed today, it's interesting that since the end of the Little Ice Age in the 17, late 1700s, global climate has been benign. A very cold winter or severe hurricane season notwithstanding. An example. The global agriculture industry in the past decades has rested firmly on perceptions that planning is possible. I mean, the assumption that disruptive changes are, are unlikely to overturn settled patterns of production distribution. I mean, you couldn't be a farmer unless you were unreasonably optimistic. And you couldn't be unreasonably optimistic, again, without a sense that that's, that, that bad years notwithstanding, you could understand what was happening. But when once a century floods or droughts or fires become possible annual events, planning is no longer possible. So how does one think about the adapting agriculture to a, an, an environment of, of uncertainty, dramatic uncertainty, and, and, and all sorts of changes. Human creativity may all figure out solutions, but it's hard to imagine solutions that not, do not require high levels of global, at least very wide, collaboration. This is, brings us to the theme that sort of put this all together. How do we governments, companies, families, in this emerging environment of uncertainty, how do we plan? How do we finance these, th this? How do governments weigh options that in many cases are often going to be so disparate? How does democratic government work in this environment of high levels of uncertainty? We have learned that when companies are under stress, they tend to do what they do best, vacuum Vacuum tube manufacturers, confronted by new semiconductors, responded by making better vacuum tubes. Is this, is this a warning to governments? Well, OK, my talk could end here. But given the arrogance, I've arranged myself for an encore, just in case you didn't ask. So here's the encore. Uh, we'll go from macro to micro, from 30,000 feet right down to the street level and the subject that I'm very much involved with over the last couple of years, museums. Now, for most of us, museums were like cathedrals. We walked as kids inside. The two strict rules, for Christ's sakes, keep quiet and don't touch anything. We saw what someone else chose to show us. We never thought of anything different. Well, as Al Jolson used to say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Leaders of museums, all arts institutions, are facing a stunning range of opportunities, of demands, and of threats. One fundamental question is the future of brick and mortar. The possibilities of change in, 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 in museums are stunning. The available technology is amazing. This is accessible today, if you can pay for it. Imagine going into the Museum of Natural History and into a di and walking into a diorama and sitting with the animals or people there. Or in art museums, walk into Van Gogh's bedroom, sit down in one of those little straw chairs, or maybe more fun, have a chat with one of Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon. That would be cool. But I mean, that's now within the range of easy possibility. All this is available. The interesting thing, the liaison here which I we had learned, and Monica worked with me on this project, it was fun, are gamers. The people who are doing the most interesting work now in terms of uh, 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 you know, virtual reality and so on are, are gamers, and these, I could tell lots of stories there. At Cleveland's Gallery One, you can trace a line by moving your hand, and the gallery big board will tell you all of the art objects, paintings, so where this line is re reproduced. So this is not just looking, this is, this is design, this is less passive. Google Arts lets us examine paintings by providing millions of pixels. We can see things that in a museum, even from a few inches away, you, you can't see. Um, I, this one I like. Now my wife and I argued a lot about paintings. And I had to remind her we're not talking about this kind of a screen. We're talking about 50 inches with texture and so on, but nonetheless paint. But imagine, because I'm interested in this, of Greek vases. Imagine saying what you want is take 
red on black, Athens, say 450 to uh, 400 uh, BC, strip off uh, athletic events, strip off the artwork and put them side by side. That's easy. Again, that, that is well within our possibilities. One issue then is it solved. Does this mean that returning stolen artifacts is no longer a problem? Every museum could have, a, have its own Parthenon frieze, either by uh, physical uh, uh, 3D printing, which is absolutely accurate, or virtual reality. Imagine going, we could watch the thing come back from the present state back to the original. Easy. That I, and I mean easy. But at the same time, demands on arts institutions as for social action, responsibilities outside of the institution are increasing dramatically. Are arts institutions social institutions? To what extent should the focus be primarily, or, or at least largely, on confronting social ills? Now, what this means is, again, what I'm saying could be done in the museum, could be done almost anywhere. This is not, initially, once you do it, it's not that expensive. There are, there are issues. But that means in every school, you could have kids walk into the Prado, you know, look at paintings, talk to the artists. Imagine you have an art class taught by Rembrandt. Why not? Or singing taught, I would, I would choose Isabel Leonard, but that's my own crush at the moment. That's from the Met. Um, doesn't have to be passive. As I say, you could, you could do all this. Sure. But again, the nasty, nasty, the nasty issue of money. We've learned that this stuff is expensive to do, at least to set up. We've also learned that while we all would go back to the Frick again and again to see the same paintings in the same place, and each time think we saw something new and exciting, that's what we do. With, with digital stuff, people want it to change regularly. And so you have to build that in. And also, as we know from our, our computers, the, the programs keep changing. The last thing we want to do is set this thing up and say, uh, you can't do it, you have to upgrade to something, something 13. All that has to be built in. Who pays? Who makes the decisions? How do you do it? And again, think of money on this. We tend to think about this plan or think about it as if there's unlimited money. Think of spending the last dollar. Do you do it by improving the Philadelphia Museum of Arts one more notch up? Or you do it by providing the schools in Camden, some of the worst schools in the United States, with the technology to have arts and music programs virtual or whatever. How do you make, and who makes that decision? So, in any case, it's not really an encore. This is the beginning of another opening, another show. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for admitting me to come. Stephen, that leaves us about half an hour for questions.